Oh, uh, thank, thank, thank you for inviting me to talk today about, as Michael said, about strengths and talents. I've been told that my talent is writing and speaking. I'm quite bad at a lot of things in life, so it is nice to be good at something. I actually don't find it easy at all, though, doing this work. It made me realise one of my strengths is consistency. I'm a consistent person in that I don't work well under pressure, and I also work incredibly badly when there isn't any pressure. At least you do always know where you are with me. I think sometimes the word talent can imply that someone's just magically good at something and it comes easy to them. In fact, it is something you really have to work at. When you see someone doing something amazingly well, they make it look easy, so easy that you think, oh, I could do that. And then you try and you realise it's incredibly difficult and it takes a whole lot of work to do any of it. So you just give up. I bet all of us have got something at home, exercise equipment repurposed now as a clothes era, a guitar that you never play, displayed decoratively because it makes you look cool, a box of expensive card making materials. For me, it was felting. I had a kit that was marked one star out of five for difficulty. I was supposed to make a felted miniature schnauzer dog. One star out of five indeed and suitable for beginners. All right. I managed about a handful of stabs with the felting needle before the needles got confiscated because I just wanted to stab everything else in frustration. However hard you work at something, some things you're not going to be the best at anyway, but you don't know until you really try. And I think a lot of us give up pretty early on. So I think what I try to say is encourage people you're supporting not to be disheartened if they aren't as great at something right from the start. There are a lot of famous people with disabilities. I want to choose someone to talk about today whose story I personally was excited while I was following it, even though he's not the most well-known person. His name is Chris Nickich. He's the first person with Down syndrome to have completed an Ironman triathlon. That's a 2.4 mile swim, which is followed by a 112 mile bike ride. And finally, a full marathon run, which is 26.2 miles. And that's all done one after the other with no break in between. And it is widely recognised as one of the most challenging, physically demanding single day sporting events in our world. At five months old, Chris Nickich had open heart surgery. He was very weak and had such poor balance in his body that he did not walk on his own until he was four. And to keep from choking, he had to eat baby food until he was six. And it took him a long time after learning to walk to learn to run. And it took him months after he could run to learn how to swing his arms at his side instead of just holding them straight above his head. And due to his Down syndrome, he has low muscle tone and he had to work a lot harder than most people to get fit and strong. He was actually from the start at a huge disadvantage for sports. He definitely wasn't born with a natural ability to succeed in that area. But he did what a lot of people don't do. The key, he said, is to, to keep moving. In an interview I watched, he was asked who his role model is, and he said his dad. His dad came up with the idea for Chris to do 1% better every time and created a training schedule based on a system he used in his own career where he helps people improve their businesses. The system 1% better involves creating a culture of continuous improvement. When Chris started training, the simple goal was to improve 1% in each exercise. He did one more lap of the pool, one more lap on the bike, and ran one more lap each day. When he was doing strength workouts, it'd be one more pull up, one more sit up, one more press up. He knew that by getting only 1% stronger every day, that he would definitely one day be able to complete an Ironman. So small steps, just one extra and only one more. And that's the sort of motto that could be applied to so many things. You could pass his message on to people that you're working alongside, telling them where you can walk one step more than the day before. You could learn one more note of that piece of music. 
would take one moment longer trying to engage in that activity. Tiny steps that can make any goal achievable. Chris got asked if he has another role model as well as his dad. And the interviewer was expecting him to name another person. But he answered straight away, confidently, that perseverance was his other role model. I think some people wondered if he understood the question on the meaning of a role model. But I think he definitely did. He perceives perseverance as a tangible being to aspire to be like. His first event he competed in was a sprint triathlon, which was against nine Special Olympic athletes. Chris finished last, but it didn't put him off. Not being the strongest didn't make him believe that he was weak. He focused on perseverance, and it's his perseverance that I believe is his true strength, more than any innate sporting talent. In an Ironman triathlon, there are cutoff times for each segment of the race. So if you don't finish each part within its time limit, you can't continue. Then even if you finish the swimming and the cycling within the time limits, if you don't run fast enough, then your race doesn't count at all. Chris was pretty close to the maximum cutoff time. He only had 14 minutes to spare, but he made it. And he's since gone on to complete a second Ironman triathlon. So we know now talents aren't necessarily something we're born with and that we can work to be good at something. But also it's interesting what people's different motivations are. It wasn't a sporting victory that Chris Nickich wants to achieve. Well enough, the sporting achievement itself was just one of the steps for him towards what he considered to be his larger goal. He was wanting to become more involved in the community. And we talk a lot about inclusion. That's what he was looking for. His ultimate goal is to live independently. And so what he was thinking about was, what can he do to make a living? And that's how it all started for him. He ended up a world record breaker, but what he was aiming for was what a lot of people take for granted, an average life with a home and a wife and a job. When he ran his second Ironman, he wasn't focused on the cheers from his fans. He was heading to the finish that time with his girlfriend waiting for him. And when he crossed the line, he presented her a promise ring. I think it is difficult for people with support needs to think about, or for people around us to think about us in terms of strengths and talents, because too often there is a focus on what we can't do due to our disabilities. For people with you know, a need for support, it seems like inevitable for that to happen. As an example, I recently moved to my new care home, uh, but this example I think would hold true for plenty of situations if you've got changes in support that need to take place. Like as a manager, you might have to ask a local authority to provide funding for extra one-to-one -one hours for someone. My social worker has always been very honest with me, she explained what the local authority has on file about me and what information she is having to take to the funding panel to secure me you know, a suitable care package. And it really isn't very nice what she has to present. It's like necessary, but really negative. The stuff all needs to be presented about what you can't do. What were my weaknesses? She has to tell them that so that they can make sure to give me the right support. And it's not meant as unkind to the individual but a social worker or probably even a manager asking for more help is having to show honestly all the reasons that something isn't working why did the previous place or any other current available place that's cheaper you know does not have the correct things to keep this person safe and well and justifying nearly three thousand pound per week care package it's something that the funding bodies are taken seriously. They want the evidence of why the cheaper previous place wasn't right, why it wasn't suitable. Of course, being in a place for anyone that best suits their needs will also mean that they have the opportunity to show off their strengths and talents because being in the wrong setup for you would mean you can't achieve things. But time is all taken up talking about what's wrong with us 
rather than what's right, because they've got a lot of cases to consider. And the main relevant issue for those sorts of meetings is always our care needs. My social worker asked if it was OK to share with my potential new home the paperwork that I've created to show my strengths, as she was all too aware that the paperwork she had to present was only a list of weaknesses. She always encouraged me to focus on what's good about me. I used to be disengaged in getting involved in anything to do a paperwork on my own support because I hadn't been listened to. And it's something I got more enthusiastic about since I've grown in self-confidence a lot thanks to being campaign for change and to come here and do things. Whereas, you know, I've had a past, obviously, of being on locked hospital wards and such like. You know, it, it doesn't make it easy to focus on, on your positives and feel listened to. And credit to my new home, they had actually turned down a lot of potential people for their empty room, which I say in credits them because we're impressed that some places could take the money and accept someone and set them up to fail. But they were very interested to check out compatibility personality wise each time somebody came to look and make sure that it would fit with the rest of the house and that we could all bring out the best in each other. Thankfully for me, the, what I'd say in a nasty assessment, the part that I don't like was done in my absence and I took part you know, in any other assessment to prove to them what I could bring to the house. And I cooked some lunch because I wanted to show that I won't just stand around and expect people to do everything for me. Even if I need help with something, that I'm going to contribute to the best of my abilities and work alongside people. I went for loads of visits, longer and longer each time, and the process went on for months, which for me made me more comfortable and meant that my prospective new housemates could check me out. I showed my polite manners, and made sure to help clear the table, off my seat to someone who needed it more without being asked. I never had an assessment or transition process in my life like that before, and it worked well for me. I mean, a lot of the times, if things are desperate and have to be quick, you sort of get popped in somewhere and it's all very sudden. But yeah, this has meant it's been my smooth settling in for me and uh, we knew things would be right. It made me confident and proud of my strengths before I moved in and I felt oh, I'm going to be encouraged so before I'd even officially moved in I was already feeling proud because my talents were being recognized like on the helping hand tree which is where we add to the tree with our hand when we have done something selfless that's improved the life of someone else we had a race tracker initially on the wall when I moved in um and we all had cars and we could move them along our tracks as we worked on our talents and worked towards personal goals. But we've since changed that setup to be hot air balloons instead. Because like in a racetrack, I just go straight along like that and sort of very focused just on this race. The hot air balloons, they're rising and falling and moving in any direction, back and forth, diagonal, anywhere you want across the sky. And it's a better representation of our journeys towards working on our strengths and talents. It's not just a one line. Sometimes we pull up alongside someone else and can give them a wave and acknowledge our likeness in being in the same place at that moment, but then drifting back apart, not ahead or behind someone else as such, just constantly crossing and changing in what you want or what you're growing towards in the way that happens in life. I think as staff, the expectations from the staff, you know, can have a big effect on us. If your expectations of me are so low that you praise me for putting in a very minimal effort, so only you know I can just do, it's going to be hard for me to grow. And you might have a preconceived idea about my diagnosis. So you think, oh, people now have got that. They're not going to be capable of much. Or you've read my history and you decide, you know what, the best we can do is just try and not have massive meltdowns, you know, not have catastrophes. So we won't push him for too much of anything special. Let's just, you know, the best we can hope is we have some quiet days. 
but then it can be pretty irritating and patronising to be praised for something if, you know, in your heart it's not a real achievement. And it can take away from in a real joy of being praised if I've genuinely done something that people do think is incredible. On the other hand, with expectations, sometimes people can have a stereotypical high expectation for a certain thing. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily encourage me to pursue writing because they assume I shall only be good at remembering things or good at maths. When people book an autistic speaker, they have expectations of this guy on the screen. After a 45 minute helicopter ride over New York City, he drew an 18 foot picture of its skyline entirely from memory. And there's so many t-shirts for sale online that say autism is my superpower. And so like random people will find out that I'm autistic. And I just like wave their bank card in my face like that really quick. And they'll be saying, recite my card number from memory and times it by the distance in miles from Saturn's Jupiter. Subtract number of buttons from my shirt and then divide it by, oh, I know, divide it by the time in the next direct train from Southampton to Brighton. You know, and they'll be glancing at their friends at this point to check that everyone knows how much they know about autism. And they're like, autistic people know about trains, innit, bruv? And then I'm just like completely out of my depth for these guys that want me to do the maths trick. I'm like 36 as a power of attorney in place for my finances because I don't have a clue what I'm doing. So, you know, I can fall back on the superpowers that my autism's given me. Super sense of smell. I have got that one. So I'll yell at this guy right across the other side in the room. Oh, I can smell you not wearing deodorant. Uh, and the guy next to you, he's wearing rose scented perfume on his crotch. Well, these sorts of things don't go down well, that sort of superpower. And I'm not good at reading social situations. And, you know, I don't, but I do know I don't want a fist in my face. So, like, I'll think fast and say, all right, I've got another one for you. I've got super hearing. And they temporarily want to, you know, no, stop wanting to kill me. They are quite interested in that. So, what cool stuff can you do with your super hearing? They ask me. Well, I say, I overhear conversations, but I misunderstand everything that people say and I make myself really ill for weeks worrying about stuff that wasn't about me in the first place. Also if a fire alarm goes off it sounds so loud to me that I can be rendered physically unable to evacuate or if I'm wearing ear defenders I can manage to dash out of a burning building but can still hear the noise and so I'm so disoriented that I run straight onto busy roads. Everyone looks pretty disappointed by this point so your superpower is being able to get yourself burned to death or ran over by cars more effectively than other people. I don't answer, I just hand them the contact details for this New York City drawing guy, it's what they want. It's desperately hard to see our strengths when we've got a difficult life and a lot of struggles. You know, and if we wait until everything was perfect in life before we started trying to achieve anything, I'll probably never achieve anything at all because it wouldn't be realistic. My good and bad moments come so often throughout the day, I'll be waiting forever. And I'm certainly not going to give up on working at my talents until I become somehow better at managing my life. You know, I can sometimes make things harder for myself. You know, maybe bring up a tougher day by pushing beyond what I'm comfortably capable of. But on balance, I'd rather then have all the joy and pride that I did achieve it that comes along with exhaustion or meltdowns or medical problems with that. I don't want a boring life and I'd rather have a life of big feelings, even if a lot of them are very hard, than to have a life with no particular feelings at all. The important thing is having a good support around us. I do need someone who reminds me when I'm having my worst patches that they do come to an end, even if I don't feel like it, and to remind me what my strengths are and that people can see it. Being a good loser is also a great quality to have. I think it's right to give people a chance to compete. Competing against ourselves is absolutely more important than measuring ourselves against others. But sometimes you push yourself more if there is that little bit of competition. 
in general, I really like people being better than me. If I am running with someone worse than me, I always just think, oh, I'm doing pretty well. You know, as long as I've beaten them, I have done well. But in reality, when I'm up against people that are far better than me, I always beat my best times because I've had to try really, really hard to try and keep up. I didn't win against them, oh, but I would always then win against myself by being in a competitive situation. And it's also great to teach people anyway how good it feels to praise other people's achievements and to remind other people of their strengths. It doesn't always have to be about us being praised for our strength. We had an open mic night in our house. And that was a really great way for people to share what they're proud of. Actually encourages some people to do more than usual. A person who always says they like singing, but needs a lot of encouragement to join in if it's an activity that is named as karaoke, but then lose some motivation, saying they like it, actually they don't, but was completely different in terms of motivation in the context of open mic night. So it seems that sometimes you give people opportunities to show their talent, like under a different heading or a slightly different environment, you might find the way that will inspire them to actually shine. Another person who plays the harmonica and plays every day. And I know myself, I hear them around the house all the time. And, and I love listening. I like all music. And I, I know he's good, but it's walking around and it's sort of background noise. And it's almost like an unobtrusive restaurant singer, you know, when you, you know, they're good, but you're focusing on other things in life. And if a person gets given a chance to give a concert and they can absolutely give their all, because sometimes we all have to tone down a little bit. We're taught is polite, you know, to not be overly disruptive if you're in a communal area. You know, and it's right, don't full blast your own activity or monopolise all the space. It is good to learn to share, but also being given the opportunity for everybody to have the full space sometimes means someone really gets brought out of themselves and everybody actually looks and listens and appreciates them fully. I think discussing how people can be really involved in their paperwork, tailoring it to their own personality and ways of engagement is really important. That's a great starting point for feeling positive, to try always to look at people's strengths with them. Having a discussion about an aspect of their challenges is actually a perfect starting point to look at the positive side of it. You can always have those howevers in the support plans, the challenge, and immediately a positive side to it. Like you might support someone to express in their, in their plan, I have a strong idea of right and wrong. Something I find hard about this is I may get upset with someone if they're breaking a rule. Please support me to stay calm and remind me it's more fun to share a game with my friends if we can all join in, rather than me getting cross with them that they didn't understand all of the rules. But straight away, you can say, the great thing about me having a strong idea of right and wrong and following the rules is I am a really helpful friend. Everyone says how good I am at standing up for people if they're being treated unfairly. I'll speak up if I see something happening that isn't right. And I'll make sure that people's rights are upheld, even if they struggle to communicate this themselves. So I think you could find it with just about every personality trait that you might feel is contributing to behaviour and it's difficult for you in a supportive environment. If you really think together, there's usually a positive to it and you can work on channeling that to being a strength the super focus that someone has and that means you always get frustrated that they're running late whenever you're trying to get them out the door to go from the food shopping. But that same super focus could be just a thing that's perfect when they find the hobby that they excel in because of their great concentration and attention to detail. And that might be transferable, a skill for their dream job later down the line. I was to mention my friend Jacob, um, he has power of attorney for me and, and 
has always now there to help me when I need it. He and his husband, Ryan, are both disabled. Uh, Jake has cerebral palsy and has only one leg and he's a full-time wheelchair user. His husband actually also has cerebral palsy and he's deaf and communicates using BSL. Their parents are two children. And one of their strengths, I think, really is their togetherness. They totally bring out the best in each other. They appreciate the strengths of each other and know what they can do to help for the other person. You know, teamwork's so important. Having the right support around you, you can achieve anything. And it's not always paid support. It's your friends and your families and your partners. Yeah, they live alone, they're great parents, but they've got each other. And that's what's made things better for them. My friend's husband, Ryan, was married before. And he was married to a man that didn't see his strengths. His his previous husband, he saw deafness as a weakness. And when Ryan was trying to get a job and drive and all these things, he told him, well, no one will want to employ you. They will not be able to understand you. You, you, you do BSL, like, how's this going to work? And he always put him down and didn't believe in him. And since... Ryan and Jacob got together. You know, Jacob's always been strong and driven with his physical disabilities. He's always known he needs to push and get on. And so he's given Ryan confidence. Ryan drives a car. He works as a personal assistant for a man with a physical disability. And, you know, they manage just fine, finding ways to communicate together. It didn't matter that Ryan was BSL and the other man didn't. Yeah, they managed. He and Jacob then set up their own business, teaching BSL. And when they had their first child, they put that on hold so Jake could be a full-time stay-at-home dad. And Ryan got full-time work at Waitrose. When there's issues in terms of communication for him, Jacob happily will step in and, and be an interpreter. And Ryan's there to help with anything physical that Jacob struggles with. And I think that's what our society should be like. We see each other's strengths and we help each other. And, you know, everybody has something to give. It can be hard to to remember. Like I said, you know, when, when things are going wrong for you in life, you know, that we've got strengths. So try to encourage people just to keep looking, keep trying and looking for their talents because, you know, failure is fine. I'm I'm a frequent failure and I've come to be at peace with that. That's who I am and having the ability to bounce back from almost anything is really what makes me Sebastian. If you show people no, no, they're brilliant and strong the way they were made and however much they struggle and if when they're having bad days, it doesn't make them less, then they will feel strong. You can join my club if you want. It's a new club. I'm the only member. But, you know, it's like the Frequent Flyers Club. But if you aren't a fan of busy airports, and then you can join my club instead. So, yeah, if the Frequent Flyers Club is not for you, join my Frequent Failures Club. Membership benefits to include a guaranteed turbulent flight, but a life that can never be described as boring. Life being full of one plane crash after another, but the ability to get up and walk away from each one. And also frequent unplanned diversions to your journey and ending up at places that you had no intention of going to, that somehow weirdly turn out to be exactly where you needed to be. Thank you for having me.